Wee oui, wee, oui, don't tell me you're at mountain lakes with all of your friends. Wee oui, wee, oui, don't tell me you're gonna start talking about craft beer again. We're cracking wise on random craft beer news. Hanging out with brewers, owners, and monsters doing interviews. It's the wee wee shows, the wee wee shows, the wee wee shows, the wee wee shows. From the brew house stage at Mountain Lakes Brewing Company in downtown Spokane, Washington, this is Wheat Wheat Don't Tell Me, Spokane's craft beer live audience show and podcast. Tim and I just created a beer that tastes like peach schnapps and orange juice. We brewed it with yeast I cultured in my belly button. It's called the Fuzzy Devil. I'm Dave Basaraba, and here is your host, Chris Sindrick. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, everybody. If you heard that tonight's show is going to be epic, that's no lie. Oh! Yes, John, Brian, and Devin Faulkner with No Lie Brewhouse are our special guests tonight. As always, I'm joined by Dave Basarab and Tim Hilton of Mountain Lakes Brewing Company. Well, guys, what's the latest news with Mountain Lakes Brewing and the Spokane craft beer scene? Well, at Mountain Lakes, we just started brewing up our holiday four-pack, which we sold last year in cans. We plan to do in cans again this year. Uh, today, we brewed a, uh, what, a, about a 13%... Uh, I, I, think about, I, think, I think it's going to be about 11, okay. uh, really pretty strong uh, old ale with uh, some Christmas spices, so we're pretty excited about it. Yeah, nice. it smelled like a bakery in here today. But, uh, and then uh, we're also looking forward to the Riverfront Winter Market. Yeah, it will be uh, Wednesday nights, is that right? Yeah, Wednesday nights starting in November. Uh, it's like, if you've ever been to Europe for the uh, European Winter Markets, you you got to get out here. The Riverfront's starting something really special down there, so... There'll be breweries, there's food vendors, there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, you can buy holiday <laughs> gifts down there. But yeah, that's what we got going, Chris. That, that sounds awesome. So um, what, what was the original gravity then on that beer you brewed today? A 1.1. Wow. Uh, 1.096. Okay, so we didn't quite get the 1.1 Pretty strong, pretty strong. Yeah. Nice, yeah. very good. Yeah. And we're, oh, we're looking forward to those yeah. for sure. And then what's the, uh, where are we right now with the Lester Cup? Is that... Well, yeah. So uh, we're we're planning a, a, a party and an awards thing for uh, the summer Lester Cup, um, and then we'll be starting the next one in in February. And uh, kind of a cool thing. Um, we won't tell you who the winners are, but they we chose... can't tell you who won, but we can tell you that we came in sixth. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, we basically either win or we come in last. So Oh, there's only six? Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Um, I wouldn't have advertised. I thought six sounded like top ten. But the cool thing is, uh, the, sorry, the winner Lester Cup, um, the winner chose red beers as the theme. So it's any beer that's red. And we're each going to select another brewery to, uh, to partner with, to, co- to create collabs uh, for our beer. So anyway... We're, uh, we'll be in the market for uh, a collaboration. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. To start the show off, we like to ask important people who work in the craft beer industry questions about what they do and how they do it. It is called Not My Beer. Please welcome tonight's Not My Beer guest from Spokane's oldest active brewery, No Lie Brew House, John Bryant and Devin Faulkner. Hey, welcome, John and Devin. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you. You bet. Um, so let's start here. I think when, you know, I, I think about if, if there's a person who's a craft beer drinker in the city of Spokane, they most likely know of No Lie. I mean, I would, I would say that probably that's almost 100%. It might not be true. But what I do find is that when I talk to people uh, in the craft beer industry, there's always this confusion of, well, was, is Northern... Lights and no lie has that has that been the same brewery over the time? Well, can you tell us a little bit about the history of no lie and clarify for people exactly um, the progression of moving from Northern Lights to no lie? Sure, we started as Southern Lights. <laughs> so this story's longer than I thought. Yes. Okay, and then we bought a lighting we bought a lighting store and um, we went through all the lights 
and uh, we love the way they looked in the north. No, I'm just, anyway. Uh, okay, so there was a brewery on site called the Bayou Brewing Company, which deserves a lot of attention and kind of gratitude for helping getting craft beer going in Spokane. Um, that was back in 1995. Okay. And uh, following that, Northern Lights, Mark Irvin, an amazing guy, went in there and uh, in about, I don't know, 2000 or so. And um, in 2012, uh, Northern Lights um, basically closed. And out of respect kind of for traditional brewing of the Bayou Brewing, which was there first, and then Northern Lights hyphenated it down to no lie. And part of the side story there was that an Anheuser-Busch uh, affiliated brewery in the East Coast had the Northern Lights names. So there was nothing you could really do with it. But the awesome part about kind of a rebirth of craft brewing in Spokane is imagining creativity and new and uh, creating a short for Noli was just an awesome way to start fresh. And uh, that's kind of the backstory of it. That's awesome. Yep. And so then um, you've been in the same brew house spot for a number of years, um, for, a, for all that time. And then uh, tell us a little bit about that, y- y- your expansion. Because you have a really great patio going on right now. Um, how did that come about? Probably the best patio in Spokane. Right. Well, which expansion? I mean, we also have the Airway Heights location. Jump in there, Devin. Okay. Yeah, no, no, please, please. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so one? yeah, so with the when the uh, the no library, really, we spent about six years just continually updating, bring new equipment in, and I want to recognize over there is Ty and Michael, two of the lead brewers at No Lie. Give it up for them. So the first six, the first six to seven years of of no Lie was really just getting the brewery we're at up to speed and putting new technology, new equipment into it, and getting it the, the way we want to make beer. Um, in about 2018, we acquired the brewery formerly known as Orelson up in Airway Heights, which was formerly Golden Hills. Right. So it's kind of an interesting story of craft brewing. It's a, it's a tough blue-collar trade that's full of imaginative, creative, really bright people that love the trade of making beer. It's a passion. It's a social thing. It's, it's about bonding. It's about fabric. So Airway Heights had been Golden Hills and Bernie Dernwald, which is a really a great brewer, won a gold medal at the JBF, you know, for uh, one of his beers, and just a really a great human being. Um, he went into Orlison, and in Noli in 2018 uh, acquired the Orlison facility, and um, here we are today. So then that allowed, I would imagine, because um, you're looking at expansion on your production level, so that facility, tell us a little bit about what's, what's, the, what's the barrel system or the brewing system look like at, at the Orlison facility, and then how much are you able to brew at the actual site you have um, at, the, at the brew house? Yeah, you know, from the original days, what was really tough for the Bayou, which was really tough for Northern Lights and really difficult for Nola, is you start in craft brewing a decade ago with a 30-barrel brew house in a yep. pub. Right. Too big. It's too big. Um, you know, back in the day in 1995 when that facility was put in, you know, what were the beers of the day in 1995 in craft brewing? They were golden ales, ambers, Hefeweizens. Wasn't even IPAs yet, yeah? No IPAs. No IPAs. Just Bridgeport. <laughs> um, and so the system was, you know, originally designed for that. And um, as, you, as you move forward years, you have a 30-barrel brew house. You have to scale really quickly if you're going to have fresh beer. Um and you're going to ship beer and have it have holding stability. One of the, you know, really tough things about making beer is it's not necessarily kegging it, it's canning it. And if you're going to ship beer to your local grocery store and it sits there for three months, potentially it gets lost, it's in the back room. What does that beer taste like in 90 days if it's been warm? And that's really the trick with a lot of things and dissolved oxygen levels, you know, how you package, how you can, how you bottle. And even you know, more so with the East Coast IPAs compared to the West Coast IPAs or... or- and stouts, these East Coast IPAs are very difficult to keep holding up. Yeah. Oxidation really kills them quickly. Right. Yeah. So if you have a 30-barrel system and you're a small brewery, then your one beer <clears throat> is 30 barrels, which is 60 kegs. And so the idea being that's hard. Yeah. Right? Kim, Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if you, if you do it over again, having a 30-barrel brew house for a brewery in 2012 in Spokane, if you go back in time, 99% of the beer that was sold in Spokane in, you know, in two, 2012 was from some other state, city, or country. There were some small right. breweries here, but all the beer was brought here and dropped in. And the unfortunate culture of Spokane at the almost being taken advantage of by larger distributors and larger breweries, they sure. dump beer here. Right. And so Spokane had been a low-price market, 
because you know I've worked at Rainier Brewing and other breweries that take advantage of a city that's not close to them. This isn't personal. It's not community. There's no love of fabric. It's a number on the financial that says ship three semi trucks to Spokane and get rid of it. Right. Okay, when that starts happening, you got twelve packs and cases stacked on pallets, and they start dropping price. That kept craft brewers out of the market. They couldn't compete. And so right. one thing I think we're most proud of over the last decade with a lot of other breweries that have been a part of it is you're able to quite create a market here that holds up pricing of great beer so people can make a living. But if you do $1, $2, $3 pints and you're selling beer that low, you literally are losing money every day. And Spokane was kind of that way for a long time. And the hard part about having a 30-barrel brew house is you have to have confidence in your beer confidence in your people, continuous self-improvement to earn that higher price that people believe it's worth. And, you know, you flash forward, the Orlis and Brew House is also 30 barrels. The yeah. beautiful part about that, jump in, Devin. Oh, I was about it's, to say, not only that, but half of our tanks are 60-barrel tanks, so it's double batches all the time. Yeah. So you got to be really, you got to know you're making what you're making and do it right. Yeah, that's like us. Exactly. Yeah, clearly. The tanks are so big. The tanks are so big. Sometimes Tim's like, Dave, I'm inside the tank. I can't walk this in my back room by myself. Dave, we, you we are were, so big. We were thinking about getting a 60-barrel fermenter, but it's like, shit, we've got to make 20 batches of beer today. <laughs> no big deal. It'll only take no, a month. That's fine. That's right. I don't think a 60-barrel fermenter. That's basically the size of your brew house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Laid down yeah. flat. Yeah. yeah. Right. We were, the stage is your brewery. Yeah. <laughs> we have a 60-barrel uh, fermenter that we turn on its side. We turn into the stage. Right. That's it. So, Chris, so an interesting part of this is if you look at New Belgium that's now owned by some international company with human rights violations, they sell like a million-plus barrels a year. Never mind the human rights. Don't worry about it. And you have Sierra Nevada does a million plus barrels a year. And you have Deschutes that does three, 400,000 barrels a year. And you have Hot Valley owned by Miller Coors that does God knows how much. And Elysian owned by Budweiser, well over a million barrels. You know, we sit at 17,000 whatever, right? So we are the tallest of maybe the vertically impaired people in the town. Um, or whatever you want to call that. Okay, sorry. No, that's but in, in all size and scale, no. it ain't much, right? right? It, we're very. There's a lot of gratitude, but Spokane has so much upside. So if why, I was, why can't there be something bigger and better? You know? But if I was taller like Devin, I could produce more beer. Yes, <laughs> okay. you can move it around easier. That's but you have to take the romper off. <laughs> right. He's right about that. <laughs> that's the thing. When when John's hiring brewers, it's like, oh, oh you're under six foot. I'm sorry, you're not going to qualify. <laughs> It's all height. You're six eight. Yeah, you're hired. I know nothing about beer. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We'll teach you. Yeah, Ty's actually eight two. <laughs> eight two. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, and one of the things you talked about here was um, the the connection to community. And I think when I I think about breweries in Spokane, a lot of them do a great job with this. And I and I often think of Mountain Lakes as one of the what the the people that does that. But you do that well too. You are recently featured in. KXLY is America's strong program for the work that No Lie Brewhouse has done helping others uh, in the Spokane community. Why is that so important as a brewery and for you to give back um, so much and be connected to community? I don't really think we give a whole lot in comparison to what the need is. You know, seriously, <laughs> if you look at what's going on in this society, it's, it's, oh, sure. okay. there's a lot going on that's difficult. The humbling part of the whole thing, when I say that with all sincerity, is if you look at the need since COVID, you know, and what's happened in our economy, there is, you know, Cindy, my wife, is a CASA. My daughter's a CASA. They work in the courts and the foster care system. You see all the pain and all the just collateral damage of childhood trauma and things going like that and how that begins the next decade, what that does to our society. It's an obligation that you just do. Um, both my mom and dad were teachers, and they were the benefit of government programs to get to where they were. And I think it's just the DNA of NOI that if we can create what I would just say wealth, which is you're able to pay people at the top market that are very valuable as part of who we are as a culture, you can put together a complete compensation system if you're able to make world-class beer. But the whole thing starts with world-class beer. If, if we're... If we can create world-class beer like Devin and Ty and Michael and Blake and Rab do every single day, and the customer enjoys that and appreciates that, 
and we're able to pay our debts and there's something left at the end, you give it back to the community because that's what beer is all about. I mean, in Europe, you learn, you know, the, sometimes it was the churches and the breweries that rallied in the darkest of times that were always there and took in people. And, you know, Northern, you know, Northern Lights to Bayou Brewing to Mountain Lakes, if it's, you know, pick a brewery in Spokane, it could be Humble Abode or whoever, they all give. Everybody gives what they can. And I think sometimes it isn't just money, but it's time. So, uh, yeah. Exactly. I think that, yeah. Round of applause for that, yeah. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> I think that's what can you the ask De- can you ask Devin a question now? I like the connection of the pub to the church. <laughs> because when Tim and I decided to open the tap room, we thought, you know, we'll try and do as 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 cool a place as we can, the you know, with the finances we have. But the whole point was this is a community center and people come together over beer just like they do we keep comparing it to Europe, but it's getting like that here yeah, in the US now where you, you see the same faces and, and, and COVID was amazing for this because where did people go? They went to support their breweries to make sure we didn't have to close our doors. And, you know, we went, we're downtown and we're blocks away from hotels. And so we do have quite a bit of travelers coming through when we're open, uh, back when we were open four or five days a week. But um, when COVID hit, none of that was happening. We relied strictly on our community to keep us open. And the coolest thing happened. Tim and I got to be down here more often in with people not just serving them but drinking with them and i think covid brought the gamut back to mountain lakes right right yeah it was a pretty cool thing that first day when uh all the tap rooms were closed we had to go beer and i remember thinking i have no idea how many people are going to come one or two or but we had a line down the block it was pretty great you know everyone coming in it's pretty humbling and that's yeah. why you give back it's a it's a cyclical like you just, like John is saying, you come in, you drink our beer, we make better and better beer, always trying to make better and better beer, and, and you keep coming back, and the money comes through us, and when we have it, we can give it away. Right. Yeah. And so, with that, um, is there anything that came out of COVID, and this is a question for everybody, that, that was actually something that you didn't expect, but maybe on a positive level? I mean, other than the community coming and supporting you, is there anything that you you were surprised about? Like when COVID hit, you said, wow, this was actually maybe a good thing. It made us slow down. It made us think. It made us pivot. We use that word a lot. I mean, is that something that you found? There's a crap ton of positive. I mean, we have nearly 20 people that love and make beer every day. I think what, you, what I really appreciate, and, and I think we all – know intrinsically now is that we're in a blue collar trade we're grinders you know we love beer but there's a lot of intelligence and creativity and imagination that goes into that and i think we really learned that we're in an art and i think during covid you learn that we have this craft that people love and that they want to bond i mean when they block people out and all we could do was growlers to go or food to go that separation of that social connection you know beer is a social lubrication of sorts that brings people together right I learned to love beer more. I learned to and love for the me trade. personally. I cherish the beer. fact that Sorry. I was able to keep working. You know, I'm in one of the one trades that was allowed to keep going, and thank God for it. I would have died if I would have had to sit at home. So on that, let, I'm going to go to you, Devin. Um, let's just say we could take away all barriers, all constraints that are that are imposed. Like money's not an option or an, an obstacle. Permits aren't an obstacle, um, and everybody can chime into this, but what's a project you would take on? What's something like, what do you have a passion about that, man, I, I can do whatever I want and I have the resources to do it. What is that project? I personally would do a collaboration brew with my old brewery that I used to work for, Kona Brewing Company, and sp- highlight our beer during the Kona Brew Fest and fly all of us out there to Kona, Kona Big Island, Hawaii, and party. Well, okay. I'm in. I'm in. I'm coming. Yeah, yeah. You, you Game bring, on. aren't we all? And you'd bring Dave and I too. Yeah, you're part of it. Awesome. Thanks. Now we just need that money. Mm-hmm. Okay. What about, uh, Tim, Dave, what about if no constraints? A project, something you would do? Well, build something bigger. We'd probably so we didn't have to brew as often. Um, I don't know. We 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 talked, uh, you know, some time ago over many beers about 
having um, sort of an outdoor space, right, where people could come and drink beer outside and, you know, even camp and yeah, you know, we that sort of thing. Would cool. We would love to have, like, anything. campsites, RV sites, yeah. a big 10-barrel brew house in an old barn, yep. uh, a live stage where... Especially if you could set up markets and stuff like that. That's yes, cool. right, yeah. right. Where we could have community events and we could have, you know, my old career was touring as a musician. I have lots of contacts. I would love to bring them back, uh, you know, through Spokane and put live shows on. Again, we'll pass the hat. But right. we dream a lot. And, and I'm usually a really good That's dreamer ab- about three beers in. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's something people seem to misunderstand about No Lie? That is literally a family-owned business. That's one of the things I come across a lot of times at bars. Is that I'm like, no, 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 we're not an Anheuser subsidiary. We're a literal family-owned business. Three of his kids work there. His whole family. We're all family. It's a family-owned business. And I'm trying to get adopted. <laughs> and we're going to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I like to add is, like, you know, Michael, Ty, Devin, uh, Rabbit. It, it literally on any given day, there's a hundred years of brewery experience at NOLI. And that's pretty awesome. I mean, again, if you're in a trade, it takes decades to get, if you want to be really good at your trade, it takes decades of work, you know, and error and risk and trial and humility. It just does. And I think because we're fortunate enough to have, you know, Devin from Kona in Hawaii and, you know, Michael came up from Arizona and Ty came from Seattle, Lazy Boy and, you know, Rab got you know creative mastermind and just blake central program right we are the words fortunate or blessed or the higher power how the universe moves to be able to start in 2012 when craft brewing was pretty dark in spokane to some degree and today it's flourishing with i don't know 40 plus breweries i would say it's not 98 percent or 99 percent of the beer coming into spokane's being consumed i'd say it's probably a lot less than that and that leaves room for just getting this thing started. There's no reason in three or four years that craft brewing consumption of tourism, filling these hotels, filling these restaurants. I mean, just all of that stuff shouldn't double or triple the amount of volume that is today. Right. Hopefully so. Yeah. So with that, let's see. There's a, you were talking about 100 years of, of experience. So a lot of you have significant amount of brew history. If, if you could go back in time... Um, and you were just starting out in the in the craft beer industry, whatever that was. What's something you would tell your younger self? Check your clamp before you take it off. Oh, which side of the valve are you on? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Check your clamp. I want to hear this story, Devin. Oh, do you really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, did you did you knock a, did you knock up. a valve off? Oh yeah. Eighty barrel tank of Wailu wheat at Kona Brewing Company. Uh. After I had 15 pounds of pressure on it, just about to rack it off, and the the PR the the the, the uh, check gun. valve the check valve was was right eight feet up. So by the time I knocked it off, I was waterboarding myself with white little wheat, <laughs> drowning myself in white little wheat. It's the most delicious waterboarding. If anybody waterboarding. ever knows or has ever done this, take your head pressure off right away. You got 15 pounds of head pressure on your tank. Turn that off first. Yeah, open all your valves up, right. relieve your head pressure. It'll start drizzling out, not gushing out. Right. So you, that's what I would tell myself. Did you save it? Uh, it oh, yeah. yeah. It was about seven barrels out of 80. Okay. So. Oh. oh, that's pretty it good. It looked like about 30, though. Right. I'll tell you the yeah. truth. It oh, yeah. Was a nightmare. Well, you're, you're standing on a wood floor that we brew on, so like five gallons seems like a river. <laughs> that would, we'd be neck deep. <laughs> seven barrels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Chris, I tell you about that time I went to No Lie. I got kicked out, lifetime ban. No. <laughs> what, what happened? Yeah. Act right. No, I was I was on the. Did you patio. have your pants on? I think. Well, I, I, part of the time, uh, I think I had. I think I had. You have nine, to wear pants. I had nineteen pints of beer, and I made a scene and got thrown out. Never paid the bill. And they, but and they I, were just wrecking balls, right? They called and said, uh, "Lifetime ban." So wait a minute. You had nineteen pints of beer. Is that true? No lie. <laughs> no <laughs> lie. Yeah, it just keeps getting funnier. Oh, come on. Come on. All right, none of that, none of that is true. Yeah. There's been, um, 
some recent articles out um, that have interesting metrics that have placed Spokane pretty high on the charts as a craft beer city. Some of them ranking Spokane as high as number one as a craft beer city, some ranking it as high as number five. But one interesting thing I found was that um, when it comes to international beer awards, um, Spokane is second only to the city of Boston with the amount of international beer awards that we've won. So think about that. When you think about Boston Beer Company is in Boston, which you can imagine has won a ton of international awards, I would assume. And then we have Spokane in at number two. Um, why or are craft beer awards important for a brewery or a city? Is that? I'll jump in there. Okay. I defer to the Charlie Papazian rule. That is, all beers are good, period. All beers can be great. It's really in the beholder. And what allows that to happen is fostering a real positive community of beer lovers, beer fans, and allowing access and allowing the tent to get bigger. Um, that's basically it. It's having, you know, for a decade, Spokane had a lot of self-defacing, you know, Spokane doesn't suck, Spokanistan, Spokanoma, Spokanada, we know all that crap, right? And there was a turning point in our brewery, which was the big ice storm and windstorm of November 17th, 2015. That's when the power went off, the snow came in, the freeze came in. We lost all our beer in our tanks. We, the pub was shut down. Our Which distributor was, was shut down. Everything, right? You find what is important to you at that place in time. And this isn't just a loan to no eye. This is a lot of breweries get to that place. You're over leveraged. You're out of dough. You have no credit. And you just got to believe. So the reason I think there's the most international medals to Spokane is because we have a lot of heart. We have a lot of grit. We love the blue collar trade. I'll go back to imaginative, creative, intelligent, and, uh, you know, driven. And the beers that Spokane, and not just of Noah, but a lot of people in this town, can compete on the world stage. And that's being proven. I think the, bo the beer tourism is going to be a byproduct of that, where this town is going to keep growing, and there's going to be more people staying in hotels and more restaurants and more bars and more pubs. And it's going to drive this economy. It's going to be a great tax base, a cultural base with the arts, the music, Sports, food, whatever it happens to be. Live podcast. Right? Live podcast. Yes. Good insert. And for me as a brewer with the awards, the best part for me is uh, seeing the notes. I love to improve on my own stuff. Mm. And most of the time they're, they're spot on. You know, right. I mean, typically I can tell what they're talking about. That's true. So you're not, it, it's, if you enter competitions, you're getting feedback. Yeah. On so the it's ones, a win win. Even the ones we do, do right. win. Exactly. Yeah, so then you're getting all this information from professionals within the industry to give you the knowledge that you need in order to improve upon that beer. Our yeah. systems or our, our uh, right. systems, really. Yeah. Awesome. That's good. Yeah, that's a great way of looking at it. I yeah. never thought about it that way. Yeah, I didn't either. Tim, nice and I job, don't, Tim and I don't really submit a lot of stuff because we're just like, we brew beers that we think are good, and if people, if our community doesn't like them, they tell us, either verbally or non-verbally, like, it they sits in a keg. It. Yeah. So I think last time the feedback was, you're not good at brewing. I think yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we, but you're, we still yeah. send beer to your mom just to see what she I know it. I know. <laughs> She's such a sweetheart, right? That's right. <laughs> So with that, with the recognition that we've had recently, is Spokane worthy as being noted in recent articles as a top five, if not a number one U.S. Yes, city? Yes, absolutely. Beer? But we is have it, to it? embrace it. We can't go out there with this attitude of putting our own ourselves down. Absolutely. We've got to go out there and we've got to be like, we have no lie. And that's we amazing. we got mountain lakes too. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, there is some sort of a thing where people, like, hate to... Hate on the big boys. And we are all in this together. Spokane beer didn't grow like so profoundly over the last few years just because of the big boys. Right. It was all of the little guys, Precious Things, uh, For the Love of God, Humble Abode, uh, Grain Shed, all of these little guys that make beer cool. In, and, and TTs. TTs. Yeah. Actually, and I think the Tap House is like Community too. Pint. What? Community Pint, the little yeah. Tap House. Never heard of it. Yeah. And Never honestly, heard of it. Yeah. working for one of the big boys, yeah. it's kind of heartbreaking because people put us down yeah. because we're the big boys. And it's like, hey, it would be one thing if we were turnkey, push button. As much as we are, 
but we're breaking our backs. We are yeah. killing ourselves here, you know? Yeah. Right. Look at Badass. I mean, they're fully automated. She sits back. She yeah, watches a movie. <laughs> <laughs> we're not making fun of you. Not at all. <laughs> you, know, you know, Chris, what keeps Pay us... Pay attention. I think what keeps Spokane <laughs> back is, uh, is Spokane Valley. The, the breweries yeah. of Spokane Valley really hold us back. Are there any specific breweries in the valley that hold you back? Maybe Badass yeah. and TT's, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe all of them that are That's in the building right. right now. That's right. So... With that, what does No Lie and the Spokane craft beer industry look like in five years? What do, what do we look like? Um, it's you. Mm-hmm. Come on. It's somebody five else. years. You're going to see a brewing school at Eastern Washington University, Woo! right? With a one yeah, and two I, year degree. You bet. Yeah. Right? I would love to have so, you come over and brew with us. The, the, the hard part about growing a brewery from 250 barrels to 500 barrels to 1,000, but wherever you're going is experienced, talented people that have done it and get the trade. And if you can start that in a collegiate program, a trade school, where they have those experiences, so they come in and they already know that, that it's a hard job. We've all had, say, people intern that look at the romance and glamour of making beer. And then they're on the floor a day or two, and all of a sudden it's not as great. Ooh, it's a factory job. It's, right. And, and you have to love that trade. And I, and I think with, if with Eastern gets a program established, it's Chris, you're going to lead. And you Woo! are. You have to have a base of people for, if it's TTs or, I don't know, pick a brewery that, that you love, Mountain Lakes. They have to be able to pull people that love beer, have some experience, and do a great job. And I think in five years, you're going to have a really cool base of people that make beer. And for me personally, the next five years, I am super excited about the new space we got at Dryfly. Well, the old Dryfly space that's connected to the side of No Lie. And the seven barrel system, five barrel system, five, five, barrel. five barrel system. Yeah. So we can start doing one offs and right. fun things more often. Right. Yes. More things with yes. local breweries. Yes. We're right down the street and we yeah. build this together. Seriously. You know how fun that is exciting. to say? Yeah. yeah. As opposed to making 60 kegs, we can make 10. Yes. Yeah. Right. We can do yeah. fun things. And I'm very excited about that personally as a, as a craftsman, you know? Yeah. Yep. Which, yeah. Is, which is interesting, right? Because you spend a lot of time, uh, you're a regional brewery. You're trying to uh, create a different market maybe than other breweries are in Spokane. So it, it takes a lot of effort to get big and then become small. Because to do a five-barrel system, you have to get to a production level to allow you the flexibility now to be able to create some one-off Fun beers, stuff. Right? Yeah. And the time to be able to do the fun stuff. Right. And so as a brewer, that's significantly important, right? Because it's your craft. It's my dream, right. you know? Yeah. That's great. That's awesome. Make the good money and still be able to do fun stuff. Yeah. Beautiful. Awesome. John and Devin, it has been a true pleasure talking with you and the exciting things happening at No Lie Brew House. Thank you so much for bringing, uh, being on the show and joining us for Not My Beer. That wraps up the first part of our show. We'll now take a break and we'll be back in a few with John, Devin, Tim, and Dave and an audience contestant for a little game we're calling Craft Beer in the Can. Welcome back to the brew house stage at Mountain Lakes Brewing Company in downtown Spokane, Washington. This is Wheat Wheat Don't Tell Me, Spokane's craft beer live audience show and podcast. I'm Dave Basaraba, and as always, here is your host, Chris Sindrick. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, everybody. And now the game that tests your knowledge of local beer. It's called Craft Beer in the Can. You get that? In the, in the, you get it? Yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> Craft beer in the can. Like like Mount Spokane. Like hyphen K-A-N. Yeah, like, like surfing the can. Like the can. I thought we were going to drink in the bathroom, yeah. Chris. No. Well, we've asked an audience member to step up to the challenge. Hello and welcome. Tell us your name and a little about yourself. Name's Dave. Worked my way across the United States from Buffalo, New York to find good beer in Spokane, Washington. Nice. <laughs> Well, welcome to the show, Dave. Here's what we're going to do at this point in the show. Dave is going to read, this is the other Dave, Dave Basarava, is going to read three local craft beer-related trivia questions. If you can correctly answer two of the three trivia questions, you will win, be a winner. Free beer and a pint glass. Woo! Are you ready to play? 
I am. All right. So tonight, Dave, your trivia questions deal with Spokane landmarks and local craft beer. Here is your first question. The original No Lie Brew House logo, developed in 2012, features a representation of what historic landmark from the Expo 74 World's Fair held here in Spokane? <laughs> Dave, is it A, the Big Red Wagon, B, the Skyride Gondolas, or C, the Expo Butterfly? Sky or D, ride. the Iron Goat? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we should have my wife up here who grew up in Spokane, but I think it's the Skyride. Yeah, it is. That is correct. Yes, when rebranding to No Lie Brew House in 2012, the decision was made to have three gondolas representing the Expo, the 74 Skyride. On the logo, the No Lie Brew House actually displays an original gondola from the ride at the brew pub. How did you guys get a hold of that? What, what, what happened there? The actual gondola. Yeah. How'd you get it off the cable? <laughs> Uh, the lights were out late at night at the warehouse, <laughs> and the lock was off the door. See, like I've always said, with enough beer, anything is possible. You know, Dave and I tried to steal the big red wagon one night. We were drinking a lot. Uh, how, did, how did that go? Well, those well Tim just sat in the wagon and said, yeah, keep like, pulling. Give me a ride, Dave. Give me a ride. No, uh, those wheels don't even turn. It's like oh, really? total sham. That is yeah. just bullshit. Yeah, total bullshit. Yeah. Total bullshit. <laughs> what the hell? Radio flyer my ass, right? Well, here is your second question. Which of the following Spokane landmarks is featured on the Mountain Lakes Brewing Company logo? Is it A, the Cathedral of Our Lady of Lords, B, the Great Northern Clock Tower, or C, the Spokane County Courthouse? I'd say the clock tower. Oh, wait, wait. Let's think, think more about Ooh, that. Think, yeah. Look at the window. Doesn't that uh, building look look familiar? Audience help, maybe? I don't know. I haven't been to the courthouse yet, but I think I'm going to the courthouse. Oh, he's at courthouse. <laughs> ah, yes. Often confused on the Mountain Lakes logo for the Great Northern Clock Tower that stands as a reminder of the rail system that once ran through Riverfront Park. Where it sits today is the Spokane Courthouse, which is a reminder of Tim and Dave's jail time. It's not entirely accurate, Chris. You know there's a difference between jail and prison, right? It, we have a fond, I have fond memories of it. Yeah. All right, so you had That's prison right. time, not jail time? Your Honor, I plead guilty. Yeah. Prison I mean, time. We're not, we're not, we're not going to go into details. So do any breweries have a clock tower yet? Uh, I don't know. Uh, well, yeah, I think it's somewhat sorry. featured on No that was an Lie. Unscripted trivia because, question. Yeah, isn't there? Aren't there uh, logos now that have the pavilion as well as the clock tower on No Lie? Yes, yeah. sir. No. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. I have a No Lie T-shirt that has a clock tower we on it. We have the uh, pavilion in scale in the pub. So, Michael, nice That's fun too. Yeah. Yes, oh, one twenty right. replica. Yeah. <laughs> Here is your third question. Down by the Spokane River, off East Spokane Falls Boulevard and East Front Street, stands the historic Shoddy Tower. Between 1902 and 1957, this tower was home to three separate Spokane breweries. What is the correct order that the three breweries were housed in Shoddy Tower? A, Shoddy Brewing, Golden Age Brewing, Bohemian Breweries. B, Golden Age Brewery, Bohemian Breweries, Shoddy Brewing. Or C, Bohemian, Shoddy, Golden Age. Well, it's hard to tell because you said Shoddy, but then you didn't say Mountain Lake anywhere near that. No. 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 Uh, okay. So I'll be kicked out tonight. I was going to say A. And you are correct. <laughs> Woo! Yes. I had to look at my script first. Is Wait, Chris. Chris, is it really pronounced shoddy? It's shoddy from it's like what I've shoddy seen. shoddy beer. It's not very good. From historical accounts, the only thing I've seen from a pronunciation is S-H-O-D-D-Y. Uh. So it's shoddy. And they actually, at one point, changed their name to Shod Brewing because shoddy beer sounds like crappy beer. Like, it's really uh, shoddy. I always thought it was shoddy, like, like smooth yeah. operator. <laughs> like, yeah. Smooth operator. <laughs> So then Shoddy yeah. started in 190, what? It was uh, 1902. 
They were there till Prohibition. Once Prohibition was lifted in 1933, then uh, Golden Age moved in, and then um, they were bought out by Bohemia around 1948, and Bohemia was there until 1957. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. The little Bohemian stubbies, my dad remembers. The little stubby bottles, Bohemian, yeah. that he drank in Portland. Yeah. It was all brewed right up here. Yeah. All right, well, Dave, how did Dave do on our quiz? Dave has got three out of three. That's a win. Woo! Looks like Dave's drinking on me. Well, Dave, uh, thank you so much for playing. We'll now take a break and be back in a few with John, Devin, Tim, and Dave, as well as a few other brewers from, uh, from uh, No Lie, Ty and Michael, with a little game we call Brewers on Tap. Woo! Welcome back to the brew house stage at Mountain Lakes Brewing Company in downtown Spokane, Washington. This is We We Don't Tell Me, Spokane's craft beer live audience show and podcast. I'm Dave Basaraba, and as always, your host, Chris Sindrick. All right, and now a game we call Brewers on Tap. Throughout the night, our audience members have had a chance to write down a question for one, a few, or all of our panelists We've chosen a smackerel of them to ask our panel to tap into the, some of that brewer and owner knowledge. Let's get started, shall we? So we got a, a good question here. Um, this person says, I'm always amazed how you have so many mug releases, special events, etc. How do you keep it all organized? How's that work out for you? I'm going to relay this message to John. You don't sleep. <laughs> PTSD. No, I, I think I mean, just speaking from uh, the things we do all tie into some of the nonprofits that we work with that tie into, for instance, we're with Matt Santangelo and Hoop Fest, and we're featuring this pint glass. You come and you buy a, a pint of beer, and we're going to donate those proceeds to creating a community court at Liberty Lake, which is just off Altima, which uh, is kind of a, a support group, partner of that area, the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Center. That's a, a real fun thing. Uh, we have the 25 days of Christmas coming up. We're together. If, if you know, we we sell beer. We're going to donate a thousand dollars a day for 25 days to 25 programs. The cool part of these programs is they serve what we call the underserved. You know, you see the underrecognized, the marginalized, and sometimes you need an extra uh, support. The more importantly, the money. It's the time that we work with the nonprofit programs. The work they do. The hard work they do. And then putting them in the light, giving them notoriety, and making it, I, I wouldn't say, more fashionable to raise money. Right. Um, these programs are small, and, and every dollar counts. Yeah. As my father said, you started at home, and, and um, we have to make sure we do our best with the people who work at NOLI first and work around us, that everybody's as healthy as we can do. And then you reach out if there's uh, issues in uh, hospitality like Big Table. And so with the, the help of the community, we did raise $20,000 for Big, Ch Big Table but where that goes to is not just people who are laid off in the hospitality industry, but people maybe recovering from drug addiction and lost their teeth, and they needed to get teeth, essentially, so they could go interview for a job. This is no different than anybody else in this room would do if you can and how you donate time. It's just if we can create a brewery, as a lot of people are, that can create some byproduct of goodness, that's what gets you up in the morning. So to ask you a question, why do we, how do we do these glasses is, it's an ever-moving, fluid thing. They're not set 12 months in advance. It's kind of how our nonprofits work, how the brewery's going, the vibe of, of society, and what can we do to have some fun. And there is one annual thing, John, the firefighters. Every year, we have a firefighter glass. Because guess what? Every year here in Washington... We're burning down. That's right. We do a smoked beer every at the end of every year. We've only been open three and That's a half awesome. years. That's awesome. Here's a question. <laughs> this is wheel. specifically for the three brewers that we now have from No Lie on stage. Um, if you could work for any brewer besides No Lie, which one would it be? <laughs> There's a dangerous Oh, question. I know this one real quick. <laughs> if I could work for any brewery... Uh, this stuff was true eight years ago. I don't know if they still do it. And it was before they were sold. But New Belgium, back in the day, seemed cool. After, the, after one year, you'd get a uh, fat tire bike. bicycle. And after five years, they would buy you a trip to tour the 
Belgian breweries. But that was like 10 years ago. I don't know if they still do that. So until then, no lies fine. <laughs> <laughs> and Ty kind of stole my idea because I actually interviewed with them before I came here. So. But you came here? Yeah. And it, was that by choice or? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. My wife is much more educated than I am, and uh, she brought us here. So, I think there's this, there's this theme in brewing. My wife is much more educated than I. <laughs> she makes more money for sure. <laughs> and she has health insurance, too. Right? Absolutely. And for me personally, I would find that wife that can afford to allow me to buy my own brewery. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't work for anybody uh, again. So if you had a choice, great it would idea, be your brewery. Yeah, absolutely. Idea. Do my own thing. I want you guys to know that if you worked for Mountain Lakes, you'd get all the popcorn you can eat. <laughs> I get the popcorn, huh? Yeah. And once a, year, once a year, we would send you to far off lands like Wenatchee and Leavenworth. <laughs> <laughs> Email me a proposal. That's right. We'll talk. <laughs> Doesn't count, Brian. <laughs> Not for you. Not for you. I think we took a, a trip as a brewery once to uh, Palouse, Washington. We did. Pretty... It happened to be a brewing event, a brewing yeah. event, oh, but we, yeah, it was pretty we good. counted it. We had we... to sleep in my van, and it was cold, so, you know. <laughs> no, but we, we paid for lodging. We had, like the bed we... And, we had the bed and bread. That, I'll tell you what, those two years were amazing. Yes. When we went down to the Palouse Festival. Yes. Two years. That was a long brew fest. Yeah, it was insane. <laughs> it was longer than Oktoberfest. Fritz Ludwig has nothing on us. <laughs> nothing. Here's a question. I, I guess this is for Mountain Lakes. How do you deal with uh, the stigma of being the big boy in town? <laughs> I, I, I guess that's you, what you fight guys. lots of people all the time. Right? Yeah, yeah. We're you know you just you take <laughs> it in stride. Yeah, yeah, you know. So it's how, like welcome to our land of beer. <laughs> all twelve hundred square oh, feet are here to serve square you. Feet. So right. good. Beating back the beer parazzi, you know, like the beer parazzi or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah however you say. Yeah. I go over there and they're brewing Sorry. in shifts over at No Lie. Yeah. I would say that as a big boy here, almost every day I put my pants on one one leg at a time. Yeah. That's that's you what I say. You never put pants on. Yeah, I was gonna say Tim could have just stopped at almost Thank every day I put pants on. Pants? Yeah. Chris is not wearing pants. He's wearing shorts. Well, nobody wears pants during this show. I mean, this is how it goes. <laughs> We do it. I don't know. All right. Here's a question. Uh, well, do you want to ask No, I want to I want to know how do they Nola? deal with it? You guys go out and drink in pubs, I assume. So and the, then you tell people, they ask you what do you do and you're like I brew for Nola. What do you what 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 comes out of that conversation? I'm going to answer that. Yeah, you drink in pubs the most. Because I do the most. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, uh, most of it beer. is the fact that they think that we're a conglomerate and I have to kind of argue the fact that we're a family-owned company and we're all busting our knuckles, breaking our backs, doing the job. The thing that I, we, we get to educate people, too, that come in and they're like, oh, yeah, like, no lie. Like, they're the, they're the big Anheuser-Busch or whatever. And I'm like, no, dude, no lie is local. So we, we do a fair amount of educating people that come in here, too. But, I appreciate that, honestly, yeah. because I do a lot well, of my we, own. We send them your way, too. We're like, uh, you know, a lot of, we get a lot of people that have just... This is their first time in Spokane. They're here for work. They're here for, I don't, for whatever reason. They're at the hotel. They come up. They find us. They drink a beer here. They have a couple beers. They like it. They're like, where do I go next? We're like, Black Label, Lumberbeard, No Lie, you know, Whistle Punk. Everything's walking distance downtown. Yeah, more or less, yeah. yeah. But you do have the best patio, so. But and for that, me personally, patio, I get in a lot exactly. of arguments with local people in the way of the word just a big, huge conglomerate company. And it's like, no, no, no. I work for one of those. We're not that. Yep. We just aren't. Here's a question. And this is actually kind of cool. You are invited to a potluck with all the breweries in Spokane. What dish do you bring? I would probably bring some sort of a, a chili, something that paired well with a beer. Generic potato chips, because I don't like those guys. <laughs> <laughs> I would do a pulled pork taco. Ah. Uh. And so is that something you Arnitas, make? Arnitas, yes. Okay. Is this something we haven't had from you, Devin? What the hell? Why <laughs> the hell haven't crazy. you invited us over? This crock pot and, you know, I mean. Yeah, but pulled pork takes some, that takes some work. No. You, 
Are you Not making? Really. Are you slow making time. it? From, slow cook. Slow cook it. All right. I love it. I'm coming over. Uh, all right. By all means. Beef Penang curry. Oh. Oh shit! This guy's a chef. So, that's Don't Michael. Don't listen to him. He's got a lot of stuff that he tells me about all the time, and I'm like, that's Dude. Michael there. Dude. What, so, what is that again? Can you explain that to Beef us? What Penang is that? curry. I've seen that on yeah. menus. Before. What, what was that? Beef Penang is a red curry. I would use some uh, Entman Farms from hey, Valley there? from Valley Ford. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Nice. Good stuff. That's... Sounds like the brewers from Nola are the ones you want to invite to your potluck. Yeah, we can cook. All right. <laughs> At least what, him and I. What about Ty? What do you got? More you him. stole my chili thing. I'd put some stag yes. in a yes. crock pot. No. Hot dogs. You're getting all fancy with Trader <laughs> no, Joe's. No, I'm no, getting hot dogs it. and chili. The, the and, uh, no, no. Maybe some buns. Yeah. Maybe a little cheese. Yeah. Shut up. Melt some chocolate in there. Make it a mole. What? what? <laughs> oh, mind blown. I'm thinking my secret weapon is I throw in a couple cans of the Nally Hot. And people are like, wow, it's got a real, like, spice to it. I'm like, yeah, you know. <laughs> Fresh jalapenos. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's one. Um, what's the worst tasting beer you have ever brewed? Oh. Worst beer. <laughs> I'll start it out. The original brew was very good. It was a coconut porter from Conan Brewing Company. But then they put a ridiculous amount of coconut extract into it. They, being Kona... And it turns nasty. Gets spicy fast, doesn't it? Spicy is one coconut's, way of saying it. Coconut's dangerous. What's what's a Tropicana suntan lotion? Oh, is the oh, other way oh, of saying oh, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Where I'm like, eh, eh, get, get it out of my mouth. <laughs> Anyone I'm, else? I went very Arizona. Did a prickly pear gosa once. Did a kettle sour. It got a little nasty in the kettle. so Maybe it, little Band-Aids? It smelled like Parmesan and baby puke. Oh. <laughs> Those are two of my favorite flavors. In Blank, horse blankety. It tasted <laughs> great, it. it tasted great. If you plug your nose, <laughs> Just plug phenomenal. your nose. I think they still use a culture from that for the Cicerone program for, like, off flavors. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah hey, hey, Dave, what do we say about Goza? It goes in the toilet. That's right. It goes in the toilet. <laughs> that's amazing. Oh, that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so Ty or uh, Tim, you got something? Um, I never, I mean, you didn't ever brew one on purpose. But uh, back on the west side, there was this thing, this one bar did called the uh, Iron Brew whatever, where they'd give you two ingredients that you had to brew with. And there was a contest. And it was okay. fun. All right. And so here's like two ingredients. I forget the one at the time. It was like agave and some other crap or whatever. So you know, agave you, is easy, but crap is hard to bring. Yeah, no, to, it's hard to make <laughs> it taste crap good. It's so good. much, so much lactobacillus. That... That's where you get the yeast from. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> it makes it no, It was just this is gross freaking beer. Can you get like, crap in an extract? It... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, crap. yeah. Just ask me later. Uh, but no, it was it, we did well. We got like second place in this stupid contest in this gross freaking beer uh, because it, those two disgusting flavors like melded well together. So I don't know that one. Yeah. All right, it was on purpose. Here's another related question: If you could only brew one beer forever, what would it be? So the opposite. Hazies. <laughs> Hazy's all daisy. We all deserve that, Ty. <laughs> yeah, porters for days. Pale ales porters for days. So, because they're so. Uh, oh, I say that again. Diverse. So, what would you go with? Pale ales for me. For me. Pale ale, yes. Yeah. Because they're so, so diverse. I mean, I could go West Coast pale ale, East Coast pale ale. Yeah. I mean, I mean you can call an IPA pale ale. You can, it's so diverse. It's right in the middle. You can do whatever you want with the pale ale. Nice. Well, and it's the subtlety of the pale ale, right? It's. Uh, it, it's it's multi and hoppy and it's the the blend of the two and and it, it's well it, you balanced. Can, you t- taste everything in your in, you know at once and uh, it doesn't have to kick you in the head to exactly. To be great. I can actually drink them. Yeah, that's right. You know, at the end of the day, I want to yeah. brew beer that I can actually drink. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I'm old, so that was cool to brew a pale ale long ago, and now. We brew it, and we think it's awesome, and nobody freaking buys it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, I'm with you guys. I love pails. And... 
Hey, you kids, you you remember Sierra Nevada? (laughs) That was a thing back then. Yeah, but that's really an IPA. (laughs) That's an IPA. You know, drink the other time. It's an IPA. That's that's an IPA. Appreciate every beer style, I guess. Here's your final question for the night. If if you could uh, sit down and have a beer with any two people, dead or alive, who would they be and why? I would love to have a beer with Jimmy Carter. Ooh. I think he would be a fun guy to have a beer with. I, yes. On many, on many levels. People that know me know why, but yeah. I, I just think he's one of these guys who has devoted himself to everyone around him, and I want to glean some of that community-building effort and see what he's like when he's drunk. <laughs> so insightful. Yeah. Wait, uh, <laughs> Jimmy Carter over Billy Carter? Who's Billy Carter? Billy's beer. Billy's beer. Oh, Billy's beer. Yeah. Well, with yeah, you know, his brother. Oh. That almost ruined his election. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, from his. Drink but beer. created craft brewing. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait! His brother was connected to craft brewing. No, Billy beer. Home Billy, brewing Billy, was legal because of him. Billy was and a then, drinker and somewhat of an embarrassment for the Carter family, and he was uh, you know, uh, almost kind of blew Jimmy Carter's uh, election. So I, so I might have, I might have more in common with Billy, but I still want to have a beer with Jimmy. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm he with builds, you. builds houses. He makes beer. Yeah. Oh, that's anyone, awesome. Anyone else? I'm just going to say Prince and David Byrne. The wild yeah! Wild. I'm so glad you got pop culture in there. Yeah. Because I'm uh, going to say wait, Trent wait, Reznor wait, wait. and like Jack Black, maybe? Oh, Jack Black. <laughs> that sounds like fun. That sounds fun. Wow. I, I would say the David Byrne one is, is okay. But oh, it's, that's awesome. He, he would have to be with the talking heads because Solo, he's weird as shit. <laughs> And he probably <laughs> hates beer. He probably hates beer. And he would he tell me why didn't. he hates it. And yeah, it'd be great. Right. <laughs> he would probably go into such a diatribe about why beer is terrible that we'd all be like, you're right. I'm not brewing anymore. You know, I once met David Byrne, and I said, what do you think about American craft beer? And he said, same as it ever was. 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 <laughs> Any other comments on who you would have? Drinking that beer with? I don't know. Maybe Jesus, because he. Oh, that would be good. Yeah, he would. He would. He would turn it into like a whole bunch of beer. Yeah. It'd be awesome. Hey, uh, yeah. Your pale ales now. You're crazy. Right. Well, right. my theory is Jesus never turned water into wine. He was a carpenter. He drank beer. He turned water into beer. Probably. Yeah. He was blue collar. Just yeah. The Romans changed Come it to on, wine. Come on, dude. He didn't want to say wine. wine. Yeah. It was probably but a Jesus brand was like, fancy. But they didn't have a word for what he had made. They had no idea what it was. Yeah. It was just... And he was like, this is a New England-style IPA. <laughs> and they're like, what? Where's, where's old England? <laughs> right. The disciples were there, and he's like, taste this. And they're like, Jesus Christ. It's not going to hold up. <laughs> it's not going to hold up. And actually, that's why they... We got to drink this tonight. We got to travel with good. this. It's not going to hold up. Chris, true story. That's why they sell beer in a 12-pack. It's because there was a 12 apostles. And... Uh, <laughs> Everybody got one, yes. and uh, <laughs> Jesus didn't need one because his glass was always full no matter what, so, <laughs> you know. Well, folks, it's closing time. As Macklemore song goes, I wish somebody would have told me, babe, that someday these would be the good old days. When I look back at the ebb and flow of breweries that were once found in Spokane, I can't but think of how good we have it right now. Now, take a long, slow look around, my friends. All of this is because of beer. Isn't it delicious? Woo! (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, that's our show for tonight. Thank you. Thanks to our special guests, John, Brian, Devin, Faulkner, Ty, and Michael from No Lie Brew House. And to Dave Basarab and Tim Hilton of Mountain Lakes Brewing Company, thanks to our wonderful server, Brian, and thanks to you for being here. I am Chris Sindrick. Good night and joy be to you all. Drink up.